This actually feeds, it, it's outside of uh, California, but it actually feeds currently about one gigawatt of baseload power into the uh, Californian grid. So what's the exchange rate uh, from uh, coal fire or gas fire to nice clean uh, solar energy? Here is Solar Star. This is the most productive uh, solar PV farm in California. Its uh, capacity is nearly 580 megawatts. But when you average that over a year, that's only 175. And in particular, if you look at the months of January and December, the average power output is only 100 megawatts. Now, we're all aware of the intermittency issues. So, again, if we just look at uh, December, January, there happens to be a, a 100 megawatt uh, battery just installed uh, in Australia. And this is courtesy of Elon Musk and his Tesla company. Ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you may think uh, problem solved. Um, but this could only, even if you could use the full capacity, it would only supply a 100 megawatt of power for a little over an hour and a quarter. So to match base load one gigawatt power, you'd actually need 10 solar stars, uh, 32,000 acres or 13,000 hectares. And you'd need to match that with 160 Tesla batteries. And if you look at the cost, today's dollars price, uh, we're looking at $13 billion. And this is optimistic. It's probably more than that. So, you know, this is where we are with terrestrial uh, PV right, right now, if you look at the base load power capability. Now, you could compare that with a, a similar Rectenna. Uh, we still need a, a little storage, as uh, John spoke about yesterday, to do with uh, up to 70-minute outages. Uh, but we're only down uh, 2,000 hectares, 5,000 <laughs> acres. So, towards baseload power, there's, uh, you may recognize uh, these uh, two designs. Uh, so, very uh, clever and intricate designs which overcome the rotational mismatch uh, between the sun pointing and the earth pointing parts. Uh, there's other, perhaps simpler designs, perhaps uh, more realizable in the short term, which are solid state in, in nature. But one issue is that uh, these always stay uh, either earth pointing or try and stay sun pointing. But in either case, you're going to get cosine losses as you twist away uh, from the sun, as you inevitably must do. So typically, these can only supply, on average, between 8 or 16 uh, hours of power per day. Now, there are solid state designs, or at least one I'm aware of, uh, which is both solid state and able to, to deliver base load power. But it does that at a huge cost. The, only one third of this massive PV array is uh, available for use at any time, and probably less than that. So in contrast, Cassiopeia, it overcomes the rotational mismatch, rather than having a clever mechanical design, by having a, a, a novel phased array design, which allows the power beam to be rotated around through a full 360 degrees azimuth. So this makes the overall design perhaps no, less, no more complicated than other similar uh, solid state designs, but this can deliver base load power 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, uh, excepting the, uh, the spring and autumn equinox periods. So if you go back to uh, the phase arrays we use now, there's a, a series of very logical steps you can take and decisions you take along the way, which lead to a very sensible and logical design. But there's a saying that if you continue to do things the same way, you'll end up with the same result. So I've taken a slightly different approach. I've actually started at uh, the very uh, bottom uh, of the design, looking at uh, individual RF elements and seeing what would it, be, what would it take to enable uh, steering through 360 degrees. So the, the next step is then to verify the, the result independently to make sure that it's not just me dreaming and having made a, a mistake on this. Uh, but then we start to reap some advantages that so we have one structure where not only do we have the RF phased array, but we can also, uh, similar to sandwich panel designs, we can integrate with other SPS functions such as concentrated PV. And particularly if we 
look at an always sun pointing design that allows the very highest efficiencies and also the maximizers on the, the use of uh, scarce elemental resources such as indium and, and gallium. So, starting step one. Uh, this is a, a simple half-wave uh, dipole. Uh, that's perhaps unusual for a phased array design. Everything seems to be patch antennas. Uh, does anyone still have a, a phone with a sticking out an antenna? Probably in a drawer somewhere. Uh, anyone still use it in the past few decades? I have a little cassette tape too. <laughs> um, it's an omnidirectional field pattern, but no steering capability by itself. However, if you have three dipoles or other similar omnidirectional antenna, you can set up a field pattern which is electronically steerable. And this replaces the, the rear reflector which you would need in a traditional patch antenna or other elements used in a planar phased array. So, next step was uh, validating the results. So, first thing is to go back to uh, a standard textbook planar phased array and uh, check that whatever we're simulating, we get the expected result. And this is the expected result if you lack uh, the rear reflector, you end up with two primary lobes uh, as a mirror image of each other. So typically you wouldn't have this, you would have this physical reflector and have double the power sent in one direction. And you would also limit the steering to around about plus or minus 45 degrees uh, because the, the beam is pretty well unusable when you're along uh, the end fire mode at, at uh, plus or minus 90 degrees. In contrast, this is the uh, same result for a, an equivalent phased array, same number of elements, similar format, but twisted into a helix. And you can see it's a, a much cleaner uh, a primary lobe. And the, the tiny uh, rear field we, we can see here is actually 40,000 times, sorry, 10,000 uh, 10, times uh, smaller than the primary lobe. And that's just with 56 by 88 elements. So that would actually improve further with more elements. And here's the two side by side. Now I must point out, I've got a slight ellipse here, and I think that's a slight modeling area, error where we should be losing a few dB uh, in the uh, end fire mode. Uh, but this is correct for Cassiopeia, where there's no dB loss when you're steering through azimuth. And this is the intensity pattern that you would expect to see at the rectenna as the satellite appears to rotate uh, once per day. The satellite's actually rotating only once per year as it remains always sun-facing as Earth travels through its orbit. Uh, of note here is that we're aiming for a peak intensity. Now, I've used the figure 230 watts per square meter. It's a, a figure which has been adopted uh, by NASA and uh, some other concepts as a safe uh, level of microwave intensity, uh, safe for wildlife, for example, to, to fly through. Uh, all the examples I'll show later on use this same figure as an optimum. If you exceed 230, then you start to get into what may be considered as unsafe levels of microwave intensity. And if you go below that figure, then that means that you will need a larger rectenna to capture the same amount of the field. And perhaps it won't be working as efficiently. So this is a, a patented design, and this uh, shows an arrangement of triple dipole elements arranged in a helical format. Now this doesn't have the, the PV uh, shown, but this does. This was the original concept, uh, which used a, a side illumination, and the solar aperture matched the RF aperture. Um, which um, w was fine, but I did uh, discover uh, late last year that in order to have even RF illumination, there's a need to uh, distribute power from the middle layers out to the extreme north-south layers. Uh, certainly achievable, I looked at a one kilovolt bus and 95% power distribution efficiency, that was adding about 15% extra mass to the whole satellite, uh, just as copper bus bar. More recently, here's an example uh, where we, we keep the same uh, Fresnel concentrators and the secondary uh, curler uh, optical element. Uh, 
Uh, but rearrange it so that the illumination is from solar north and solar south. So not shown here is the reflectors required to do that. And this rotation is purely to show you the design. It, it doesn't reflect how the, the satellite actually rotates uh, on orbit. And uh, you can see that this is two quadrants on either side. So the total illumination of the whole satellite is, in this case, one sun. But unlike uh, a sandwich panel design now, we can use both sides. So we can actually have two sun illumination of the whole structure. This was uh, another example where I looked at the possibility of using standard PV rather than high concentration concentrated CPV. And uh, I did find that uh, with radiation protection cover glass of 100 micron thickness, this added a significant weight penalty. We went from being around about 50% of the SPS mass to over 75% of the SPS mass just in PV alone. But uh, one thing I should point out here, that all the PV is being used. There, there is no redundant PV in this example for a solid state uh, satellite. So here's uh, three concepts going from 1 gigawatt to 1.4 to 1.9 gigawatt. So here we have the quadrant's uh, 45 degree reflectors as shown. Again, this is just to illustrate the, the design. Uh, this is the actual rotation once, once per year. And we can quite easily, with no added complication, replace these quadrant reflectors with full elliptical reflectors at 45 degrees, giving a total of two sun illumination. And uh, we don't uh, increase the, the mass by 40% when we do it. We actually get a, a gain uh, by doing that. And we can actually go up to four sun illumination, uh, keeping the, thermal, uh, the, the temperature within thermal limits of the CPV. And this is done uh, with uh, solid state uh, reflectors. And a fairly complex uh, arrangement there. They're not quite uh, parabolic. And that's to ensure that we have a concentrated but collimated beam coming from solar north-south. Uh, there's been some improvements which, uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, talk about uh, at this time. And before I move on, these previous examples were all for a geostationary orbit. But we can actually achieve near base load power levels from much closer in orbits. And this is an example of a three hour sun synchronous orbit. So, yes, the, the satellites appear to move uh, in the reverse direction to, to convention to maintain the, the plane with respect to the sun direction. Now, it's a little hard to follow on here, but if you just follow the red satellite, you can see even as it goes through Earth's shadow over here, you never lose you never enter Earth's eclipse. So the, one of these five satellites in the constellation can always uh, beam power to somewhere on the Earth. And this over here shows that uh, with an international collaboration, we could actually beam power to uh, three rectangular sites on the Earth using five satellites and achieve simultaneous near base load levels. So there we can see nearly 98% for for Japan, that this was originally shown in, in Japan. Uh, Chicago, uh, nearly 90%. And the example here is Moscow, it's uh, nearly 71%. And that's simultaneous. So you're getting a very high rectangular utilization and around about 50% satellite utilization. And by going a little further out uh, to a medium Earth orbit, a 12 hour orbit, um, or any orbit between the two Van Allen belts, uh, not animated this, but uh, here we have four satellites, taking advantage of the wide beam steering capability, so the rectenna would have to work down to a fairly low elevation, but again, uh, near base load levels of power to four rectenna sites around the world, and the same utilization of the satellites. So now I'd like to move on to the materials and the technology used. And, uh, the, the key point I want to get across is that I've only considered very high technology readiness levels or commercially available parts with uh, a previous space precedent. So here I'm showing the, the Icaros uh, satellite produced by the uh, solar sailing satellite, a Japanese uh, example. Um, attitude control, where we can use the limitless propellant of photon pressure. And uh, if we have 
an area of extra reflector forward of the center of mass, we actually achieve a passively stable uh, attitude control, similar to gravity gradient stabilization. By overlaying this with electrochromic uh, panels, then we can have active control to dampen out any oscillation. Here's the, the reflectors themselves. Uh, again, Icarus is one example of metallized polyimide. Uh, I believe Icarus used uh, aluminium as, as the uh, metallization. Uh, here, I believe we need to use uh, silver uh, because this is sh showing the spectrum of the triple junction CPV I've used as an example. And you'd actually get quite a loss using aluminium where you're getting around 97% uh, uh, reflectance uh, from uh, using silver across the band we're interested in. It does cut down on some of the harder UV which uh, no longer reaches uh, the CPV. Uh, again, precedent, here's a, I can, I can see Paul nodding his head, there's a stretch lens array, uh, which used a similar high concentration, uh, Fresnel concentrators and secondary dome optic, I believe. And this is the actual configuration I'd like to use, which is based on experimental uh, testing by a company called LPI. Uh, which gives very good results, uh, very high uh, gain acceptance angle product. Uh, this is actually a COTS uh, CPB cell uh, by the company uh, Azure Space. They do sell non-concentrated versions which are space rated. I've also used data from Spectrolab. And as for the actual circuitry on here, uh, this is uh, industry standard uh, flex circuitry. Precedence there, would, for example, would be the Curiosity uh, rover on Mars. Um, we need to be able to launch this. Again, I wanted to use today's technology. So here's the, uh, uh, the Falcon 9 or the Falcon Heavy uh, payload shroud. Uh, I should point out that don't believe all the hype about it being able to lift nearly 64 tons to low Earth orbit. Its actual hard limit is around 10.8 tons. And the complication is that whatever payload mass you're taking, for example, eight tons reusable for, for the boosters, the center of mass has to be concentrated around about uh, the first 440 millimeters of this 11 meter tall payload shroud, which is a little bit of a complication. Here's uh, two examples of typical payloads to launch the Cassiopeia array uh, along uh, a geosynchronous uh, transfer orbit, which then translates uh, to a uh, geosynchronous uh, circular orbit. And we don't want to, I'm moving a bit ahead of myself there. Uh, so this is an example of uh, rendezvous along the transfer orbit before one of these orbital maneuvering systems then does the uh, uh, plane change and circularization maneuver to bring it into the geosynchronous orbit. And I've actually chosen a Laplace plane orbit optimized for the very high area to mass of the Cassiopeia array. So this is a very stable so-called frozen orbit. And we don't want to throw away any of the mass. So these, this uh, composite frame structure was used to control the multiple layers uh, lifted as a payload and then forms part of the, the backbone structure of the Cassiopeia array. So again, here's the uh, three examples. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.